But that's what we need Portland to become. Yes. A group of disciples where all of us are all in on the one holy passion. Okay. There's no question about our convictions. There's no question about our commitment. There's no question about who's really the Lord of our life. happening in the church right now over about 40 different individuals are actively studying the bible yeah, that's good that's good you know today like i said we got some great birthdays in the house i hope you gave angie an extra hug right there amen you know i do want to say a phenomenal job to our dear sister phoebes and her contribution amen Man, you guys didn't know she was going to come after your diet today, huh? She's coming, she coming after you. You thought it was going to be about the cross. She's telling you to be eating communion-sized food all week long. That's what she was doing. Uh, give it up to the Marikasis for their contribution message. And so inspiring but convicting. We, we should just instinctively give the bigger cookie to God, amen? Uh, and I know I'm looking forward to doing that from this day forward, amen? So turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. Come on, Preston. Come on, bro. We're getting into the Word of God today, right? Yeah. Hopefully, as disciples, not for the first time today. Amen. <laughs> Matthew 11. Y'all got quiet right there. Matthew 11, verse 1. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Oh, no. Jesus replied, go back. <coughs> Report to John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive sight. The, blame, the lame walk, and those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear and the dead are raised. The good news is preached to the poor. Amen. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out to the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he is least in the kingdom of heaven. He who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. The title of this morning's lesson is Forceful Advancement. You know, we want to, it's an amazing passage that we're reading through here. And we see Jesus' disciples, and he's discipling the 12 right here, and then he sends them out. But he stays and he keeps teaching and he keeps preaching. And we need to make sure that as disciples of Jesus, we're not simply giving people the charge, but we're leading the charge. Amen? You don't just teach people the Bible studies and then go and do what you want. You have to live out the scriptures in your life. You know, but it's, and it's always good. It's always cool to see everyone taking people through the Bible studies. I love walking around campus and seeing Angie just in a bunch of Bible studies surrounded by these women. I love seeing Tone hanging out with the guys there at UP and doing oh, yeah. Bible studies. It's just always encouraging. But what's also, this goes on and it says John here is in prison. And when he gets there, he sends his own disciples to Jesus and he asks them a question. Are you the one that's to come? Like, are, are you the real deal? Are you the guy? Or should we just be looking for someone else? What's going on here is John is struggling in his faith. He's struggling in his faith, not because he's in prison, but it could have a little bit to do with it right there, amen? But it says that he's struggling because he's not quite sure if Jesus is the Messiah. Now, the reason John was taken back by whether Jesus was the real deal or not was because Jesus had just sent the 12 on a mission trip to Galilee. 
And now he himself is in Galilee preaching and teaching. And John's misconception here is, dude, why are you in the ghetto? Why are you in the slums of Galilee bring, trying to bring God's kingdom here? Why aren't you trying to just rejuvenate Jerusalem? Where the palaces and the, and the religious people and the preachers and, and those who have those fine clothes. John didn't understand that God was going to work through Galilee and not through the palace in Jerusalem. I believe that's why verse 7 and 9 are there and spoken through by Jesus. What he's doing is he's relating this to the Pharisees. The Pharisees, wore, they were the weeds swung by the wind of whatever was happening in those times. Whatever's the new fab, I'm going to do it. We're just waved back and forth by like a weed in the wind. Right? They were the ones in the fine palaces of the temple of God. They wore all these nice bougie clothes. And, and John says here, or Jesus says to John here, he's like, John, your, your ministry was in the desert, dude. I'm in Galilee. Like, don't, 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 don't get worked up here yet. Yeah. But what I also love is the proof that Jesus gives John to prove that he is the real deal was the fruit of his ministry. Mm -hmm. It was the fruit of his ministry. He says, you know what? Don't worry about what city we're starting in. Don't worry about the, the crazy bunch of guys I got. I know I got a zealot. He's got a little problem with the government right now. Right? I know we got the task collector. Not everyone is a fan of this guy. But these are the guys I'm working with. But go tell John what you see happening in my ministry. He says, tell him the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear. <laughs> The dead are raised and good news is preached to the poor. You know, I started thinking about that. I said, man, it's amazing to see the fruit God has given us in Portland just this year alone. Yes. Right? God, God allowed the Davidsons to place membership back into Portland. Amen? <laughs> then he brought Eric to place membership back into Portland. <laughs> then we saw Talia baptized. <laughs> we saw Christopher baptized. Yeah. And Cruz is looking to get baptized. <laughs> itself and we're just getting into the sowing month you know every harvest season and anything you do has a plowing a sowing and then a harvest a reaping the harvest time and january is all about plowing we talked about it being jubilant in january we talked more about being having great relationships with god closer to god than ever before hopefully this last month we've spent more time in the word of god greater time praying some time fasting even and just Plowing the field, working our hearts so that we can be ready to do the work with God in February. Come on. You know, so January was jubilant January. Yeah. Okay. But now we're going into forceful February. Woo! Nice. Okay. Yeah. And, and, you know, we're as we're getting out of the, the plowing month, we're going to go into a month of sowing. Mm -hmm. Where we just, we really got to go after throwing the seed. Yeah. You know, we already have even... Oh, going through the, the plowing month, we already have a handful of people that are moving forward and really wanting to be disciples, really wanting to go after getting right with God and baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, and eager to get restored in their relationship with God, eager to place membership with the kingdom. Amen. Amen. But I share this to help us to see, to, to be able to see the evidence for yourself. Yeah. That the dead are being raised to life spiritually. Wow. The blind are able to see. Those who could not hear the voice of God have now heard it and they're preaching the word of God themselves. But you know, I do believe we need to move on from here and we need to go into forceful February focused. And I believe we have to collect a, we all have a collective desire to see forceful advancement, not just in Portland, but we want to see forceful advancement in your own house church. You want to see forceful advancement? I want to see it in my Bible talk. Yeah. I want to see forceful advancement in my own personal walk with God. But I believe there's one thing that we're going to have to keep up if we want to see this happen. Okay. It's my only point, amen? Okay. I'm trying to keep these things simple these days, all right? So don't miss it. Point number one, forceful intensity. Forceful intensity. You know, intense by definition means having extreme force, having a degree of strength. It's also known for being extreme, fierce, or severe. Somebody once said that the most distinguishing feature of a winner is their intensity of their purpose. Now, we have people among us in Portland who we look at and we just know they're fruit machines. 
Man, they do, oh, really? They're they so cool. active. They're so good at making disciples. They're always, at, at least every month, baptizing somebody or helping somebody come to God. And you can think of these people and you go, man, that's a fruit machine right there. And I started to think, man, what's the difference between fruit machines and those who just desire to be a little more fruitful? Yeah. It's the difference. The fruit machine people are intense about their purpose. Yeah. They have an intensity about their purpose. Well, they share yeah. their faith everywhere they go. Yeah. Yeah. They go to the gas station. They're talking to the guy at the attendant. Right? They're going to the grocery store. They're talking to people in the grocery store. They're going anywhere. They're going to the trampoline park or whatever it may be on a walk. Wherever they are, they're just sharing everywhere they go. And I started to think, man, so they, 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 they share everywhere they go, but they also follow up all the time. They stay in there. They water the seed that they've planted. It's not just, hey, I want to meet up and I only want to do a Bible study. No, let's get a coffee. Let's build a friendship. Let's play basketball. Right? Let me hurt your knees for a little bit right here. Right? Like Whatever it may be, they're building a friendship. And these people are in an intense cycle of sowing and reaping. And, and the distinguishing factor from those who are extremely fruitful to those who just want to be fruitful is the intensity of their purpose. Yeah. You know, it's also been said that we need to learn to stop trying to do extraordinary things and start doing the ordinary things with great intensity. Ooh, come on. Wow. How much better would your relationship be with God if you just did the basics with a lot more intensity, mm. wow. you just really hard line went after your prayer life. Yeah. Right. Nothing too crazy. I'm not talking about some extra teaching here. Yep. Just a great conversation with God yeah. right. with intense purpose. What if you did that with reading your Bible every morning? Yeah. Turn me to Matthew 21. Come on, Pastor. Here's the thing we're going to learn today. Jesus was an intense person. Yeah. He was. You're like, how, how could the Lamb of God be intense? Well, he was also the Lion of Judah. Amen? Yes. Matthew 21, okay. verse 18. It starts off and it says, early in the morning. See, it just got intense for you. Some of you read that and you go, oh man, that's intense. He's coming after me this morning. Early in the morning. You know, I've come to learn early in the morning isn't like the hour you wake up. It's how much time you wake up before your first appointment. Yeah. Some of you are like, oh, yo, I wake up early every day. I work at, I, I go to work at five. Wow. What time did you wake up to spend with God? Yeah. Well, you actually woke up late. If you woke up at 445. Not 445. Early isn't dependent on the hour of the day. It's how early do you get up before your first appointment. Yeah. You know, Matthew 21, it goes on. He says, early in the morning, as he was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it. But he found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but you can also say to that mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Jesus had some forceful intensity. He walks. He's getting a little hungry. Maybe hangry as we could describe it right here. He goes to the fig tree and he's like, there ain't no figs on this thing. And he is ticked off with the fig tree. He rebukes the fig tree. I've never yelled at a plant. Like, I've opened an orange, and it's like not a good orange. I've just thrown it out and got a new one. Jesus was not happy. He's like, I expected to see fig trees on this thing. And I think what's interesting is it points out that it wasn't dead. It just didn't produce fruit. It produced leaves, which only benefited itself. Many of us only produce leaves that things that benefit ourselves. And you're a fig tree with leaves, but no figs. And there's been personal growth, which is good, but you're also expected to have multiplication. You know, Jesus was forceful that he walks, he sees this tree, and he curses it right there. And he says, you will never bear fruit again. 
the disciples see this, you can look through all, all throughout the Bible, guys. Jesus is an intense figure. Yeah, right? Constantly he's challenging things. He's constantly pushing the envelope. He's constantly going to the next level. He's constantly discipling his guys. And he's expecting his disciples to grow more, do more, and be more. We, as disciples, need to become forceful prophets like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. But it takes intensity. Yeah. It takes us to be intense. Right here, Jesus wasn't okay with the fruitlessness. Yeah. In the same way, we can't be okay with fruitlessness. Yeah. You personally cannot be okay with fruitlessness. Fruitlessness is a disposition. It's a mentality. It's like a, it's a character. I've even heard sometimes people say things like, you need to be okay when you're not fruitful. And they use some obscure scripture about being okay in the good times and the bad. And there's truth to that. And there's, there, there will be a time when you're doing all of the right things and you're not having the right results. But my Bible says that for those who do not give up and grow weary, you will reap a harvest. Yeah. Yeah. The reason you don't see the harvest is because you've given up. Yeah. You stopped doing the right things because you didn't see the result in your time. Mm. Right? That's why, why do we all throw in, I'm proud of Feech, because she didn't throw in on the diet when the results weren't there yet. Right? And now after a couple weeks, she's seen the results. I imagine she keeps it. She wants to keep going. Right? Right. But why do people stop doing things? Yeah. I'm going to drop this class. Why? I'm not, I'm not going to do it. There's no results. Yeah. <laughs> Bad results. Amen. Like you stop pursuing, whether it's exercising, whatever it may be, because you feel like there's no progress. You know, but the Bible says right here that... If you do not grow weary and you never give up, as Galatians 6, 9, you will reap a harvest. You know, part of not giving up is keeping the intensity. Wow. It's staying intense. Yeah. That, yes, maybe the last 10 people you've talked to have walked away. Right. But maybe the next 10 can become disciples. Right. Amen. And you have to stay forceful in your advancement. <laughs> But not somehow use it as a plea that, hey, you don't know, you don't help anyone, and that's okay, and somehow God's okay with that. God is never okay with a fruitless disciple. He's never okay with it, just as he's not okay with a fruitless fig tree. It's never what he wants. He wants you to be fruitful, and he wants you to advance. Because there are souls on the line. These are people's lives. See, I'm surrendered as a disciple for anything. I, I, I truly believe I'm ready to die for my convictions. I, I don't feel like I'm going to waver for them. But there's one thing I'm not surrendered to. And that's disciples here not growing. Come on. Yeah. That's disciples here not being fruitful. Yeah. I'm completely not surrendered to that. And I don't believe God would call me to be surrendered to that. Right. God expects your Bible talk to grow. Yeah. Yeah. To you. Yeah. Or is it just a hope? A good idea. See, God expects it to grow. And so we have to have that same mentality. You need to fight to be personally fruitful. Lead your Bible talk to growth. You need to be close to God. And you need to preach it into existence with intensity of character. Amen? Turn me to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. In verse 12, it says, If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Paul's here and he's writing to the church and he says, Man, we would put up with anything as long as it does not hinder the gospel. So we'll put up with a lot of nonsense, but if it's going to hinder the gospel, that's also implying we will not put up with it. We're not going to put up with something that's going to hinder the gospel of God. You know, at mid men's midweek, we talked about throwing off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. I got to ask us, guys, is your lack of intensity hindering the gospel from spreading? Is your lack of intensity of purpose, serious about your purpose, hindering the gospel of God? 
it's amazing to see what Life Force can do. Some people wonder, man, what's Life Force? How do I get it? I just, what, how do I have an impact? Yeah. Well, there, if there's one distinguishing characteristic in Life Force, it's the intensity of purpose. Somebody that is extremely intense about their purpose yeah. will just naturally be oozing some Life Force about what, they're all, what they really are all about. Now, what's interesting, if you go back to Matthew 21, and in verse 23, the chapter goes on. And if you keep reading this scripture, Jesus keeps getting a little hotter and a little hotter and a little hotter. So he just rebukes the fig tree and then teaches the disciples. By verse 23, the the heading of this this little paragraph says, The authority of Jesus questioned. You should never question the authority of Jesus. Amen. 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 That was their first mistake here. But it goes on and says, Jesus entered the temple courts while he was teaching. The chief priests, the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked. And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, "I I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism. Where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from men? They discussed it among themselves and they said, well, if we say from heaven, he will ask them, why didn't we believe him? But if we say from men, we're afraid of the people for they will hold that. They all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus. We don't know. (laughs) Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority am I doing these things? What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not. He answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what the father wanted? The first they answered. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. The tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe. Wow. You know, it's interesting. You you can read this whole chapter, but here is what they're going, they're trying to do. They're trying to outwit Jesus, which again is another mistake. You can't do that. But they're trying to outwit Jesus and they just end up looking like idiots in front of all of their friends. And then Jesus goes on to tell them two different parables. One about two sons. One had a good heart seemingly, but he didn't do anything about it. The other one had a bad heart, but he did what God wanted them to do. And then he asks them, which son was right with God? And they go, well, the one who obeyed. And then he rebukes them right after that. And then he tells them which son they are by telling them another parable, the parable of the tenants, right after this. See, God, he's going on and he's explaining, like, hey, God gave you the kingdom. He gave the kingdom to the Israelites. He expected you to produce its fruit, just like Jesus expected it from the fig tree. And he expected them to go out and work the field. And so he sent people to them again and again, reminding you, you have to go work the field. You have to take care of God's vineyard. You need to be a worker in God's field to warn them. Finally, he's like, you know what? You didn't listen to the messenger. So the son came and then you killed the son. And they thought, then you thought you could take the vineyard. And it says, God will take it away from them and give it to a people that will produce its fruit. He said, he's going to take the kingdom away from you and give it to a people that will produce its fruit. Meaning the kingdom will not become a part of somebody and it won't be yours if you don't help produce its fruit. Just because you're sitting around enjoying its fruit, you'll end up losing your place in the kingdom. He'll take it away from you. Jesus doesn't back down any time here. He's like, all right, that was hot, but I'm going to get a little hotter right here. Okay. All right, now you're boiling, but we're going to get this thing going. And he turns it up, and he turns it up, and he turns it up. Sometimes we, like, we hear the standard, and we're like, come on, Preston. Like, you gotta get, you got to be a little nicer. We can't be nicer than Jesus. There's no nicer quality than calling you to obey Jesus. Wow. There's no nicer quality than expecting people to live like disciples. That's true. Sometimes we're like, man, you're just not, it's not loving, like, I feel like what Jesus was doing here is what we call love, right? Yes. But this was pretty firm. Like, dude, you, you, you don't, I'm going to take the kingdom away from you. You didn't produce its fruit. Yeah. It's and we have to have a, a deep conviction of, again, as Arrow said, we're a Bible church. We do yes. things according to the Bible. Yeah. Not your feelings. Yeah. Too many disciples let their feelings dictate what they're going to do for God. Yeah. When the Bible is supposed to dictate what you're going to do for God. Yeah. Right. 
And we're like, why do you go <laughs> feel like it? It's 30 degrees out today. It's cold. And we stop wanting to do it based on feelings. Jesus doesn't back down any time. He goes on to say that, hey, if you fall on this rock, it's going to break you. And if you don't break yourself, then it's going to crush you one day. But you know what, Jesus? I just don't see. I look at Jesus. I don't see a laid back guy. I don't. I think some of us are far too laid back. Far too chill. We're not. We don't have an intensity about our purpose. Okay. And because of that, you're dying spiritually. You're losing vision. It's not as exciting as it once was. It's because you're not living it like Jesus was living it. You're trying to recreate Christianity your way. Jesus was an intense man. You're like, nah, I don't know, man. Jesus reclined at tables at times. He reclined at the table two times in the Bible. Two times. One, he was at the anointing of Bethany where he disciples everybody while reclined. That seemed like an intense moment. He seemed like he was chilling, but he was intense. The second time he was reclined was at the Last Supper, where he preaches a sermon. He exposes Judas's betrayal. He predicts Peter's betrayal. He washed a gang of smelly feet, and then he sang a song. Woo! It's intense. When was the last time you washed your brother's feet? See? That's too intense for some of you right there. Some of you all need to wash your own feet first. Amen. <laughs> But that was the two times he reclined. They're like, he, no, 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 no. Uh, he, he also took naps. He wasn't that intense. When Je- The one time it's recorded that Jesus took a nap, it was in the middle of a storm. That's intense. Jesus' lifestyle would be described as intense. Would your lifestyle be described as intense? Would they describe your lifestyle as intense? Would people look at your schedule, look at just the way you live, and just go, wow. Man, that brother, that sister, that person, man, they have an intense lifestyle. I've never seen anything like this before. That's how Jesus was. Right. And if that's how Jesus was, that's how we should be. Amen. If we're not, then what's happening is you're hindering the gospel. Ooh. And Paul says we should put up with anything except what hinders the gospel. Come on. And when we're not as intense about our purpose as Jesus was, then what we're doing is we're hindering the gospel. And it's okay. Repentance is refreshing. I had to repent. I realized, man, I'm not as intense about my purpose as I need to be. I need to get a lot more locked in. And I don't want to give anyone any excuse why we can't all be intense the same way. Yeah. And so I realized, man, we don't have like a lot of full-time people in the ministry. So sometimes people feel like, Preston, you just can't relate. I have to wake up. I have a job. Like I work for a living, Preston. And I have to go to work early in the morning and work all day long. And then I'm tired when I come home. And so I realized, you know what? I got to get a lot more intense about my purpose. Yeah. Set that alarm. Starting Monday, 4.30 a.m. Every single day this week, gotten up at 4.30, maybe 5 o'clock. But that alarm went off at 4.30, am I? I'll be transparent. But I'm up every day at 5. I have a phenomenal time with God. Reading, praying, I have a great workout, and then I'm ready to just work hard for God all day long. Come on, Preston. The leadership, they see, I, I put what my schedule is usually like. Pray for this study, pray for this study, pray for this study, pray for this study. All right, the Thursday we had a study at UP, then we went to Salem, then we went to Clackamas, then we went all the way back to UP. That was the plan. And, and so people are like, oh, but you probably go to bed at like 8. No, I'm going to, we're going to bed at like 11 still. I'm with you. We're working hard till late nights. Uh, Arrow, I was really encouraged. Arrow sent me a little encouraging text yesterday, and I sent him a little screenshot. I was in a D group till 10.30 last night on Zoom. I was like, Joe, I just saw you at ICCM like four hours ago. What's up, man? But we had another D group till late at night. And then we still wake up early. I just realized, man, I got to get a lot more intense about my purpose. This isn't something I want to casually go about. I want to get serious about this. I call you to get serious with me. Get intense about your purpose. All right? Don't, don't kick, kick those excuses that come into your head. Right? For, at first it was, you don't understand. Now I just told you I understand, but now you're going to be like, you're just not my age. You don't get it. <laughs> I, don't know, I get it. All right? You stay close to God, your age won't have anything to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. 
But what do you think it would be like if your house church, of all the disciples you have, leave here today just on fire with a great intensity of purpose to advance God's kingdom? What do you think God would do? I I truly believe we wouldn't just see a couple baptisms over the next couple months. You'd see probably about five baptisms per house church, which would be 15 baptisms in just the English ministry. You know, God's brought us to 90 disciples already this year. Wow. We, are, we are, God willing, we'll see 91 here with, with Cruz. Amen. 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 But, but, but then we're going we're gonna to blast through 100 in February. Yeah. And we're going to solidify well past that in March. Come on. And then we're going to finish this year well over 100. Come on, bro. Which is, which is inspiring. Yeah. But it's only if all of us choose yeah. to get intense about our purpose. If we all walk out of here on fire yeah. for God. You know, we read through the book of Acts and we always want the book of Acts results. We're like, man, 3,000 baptized. We got to get there. And then people are like, how'd they do it? Well, you know, it looks like they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the prayer. Man, that's, that's great. Like, they were having parties and cookouts all the time. Like, <laughs> we should just do that. But what we don't read is two chapters later, people started getting arrested and getting their lives threatened. It got intense pretty quick. It was like, man, kumbaya, God's good, this is awesome. And then all of a sudden, like, you're about to go to jail, or I'm going to kill you if you keep doing this. And they didn't stop. They just got more intense. They got more serious. The persecution turned up the heat, and the disciples turned up the heat. You know, there's a preacher that talks about the stages of our walks with God. And he talks through this idea of how in the beginning they have what they call the stage, the beautiful beginning. And some of us may understand this. The beautiful beginning is you got invited out to church. They saved you a seat. They said, hey, we'll go out to lunch. I'll buy. They even offered you a ride. Right? You, you, you get made into a disciple. You get baptized. And then all of a sudden, as you're living like a disciple, nobody offers a ride anymore. No one's saying they're buying lunch. Now they're asking you, where's the visitor? Did you, did you bring someone to church? And then you start getting challenged on your character flaws in your relationship with God. Hey, wait a second. And then you hit the next stage, which is wrestling with God. And the truth is, you really need to wrestle with God before you can walk with God. We learned that from Jacob. Okay. And he goes on to say that after you've wrestled with God with some time, and he gets your heart to where it needs to be, because that's really why you're wrestling with God, is to fix your heart. You might think you're wrestling with God because of all the other people's hearts around you. No, no, he's doing it to help your heart. And once he helps your heart get to where it needs to be, and then you get back into walking with God, he says you get to the final stage where he calls it the one holy passion. And he says, this is the point where you reach and you realize your life isn't even about you. When you can get to a point and you realize I am simply just a utensil to God. My life means nothing to me anymore. All I care about is completing the task that God has put before me. Testifying of the gospel of God's grace. That's the one holy passion. Realizing that you got to go through all of these little stages. And I, I read this and I started to think, man, I think we can relate as a family. Yes. We come out, we get invited. It's really awesome. We get baptized. We're going on encouragement dates. So some of you need to do a lot better at it. <laughs> then you start, people give you quiet time packets. Like there's encouragement cards. Like there's amazing things said about you. You're getting lifted up. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> yeah, happens. eventually that goes away. And you start getting discipled in your character. Right? Sometimes people, some people confuse character and personality. Uh-oh. Two different things. Right? You can very, be a very lively person with no character. That's for sure. Right? You start getting your character addressed, your convictions addressed. It starts getting a little uncomfortable, and you start wrestling with God. And sadly, some people throw in the towel at that point. Oh, no. They give up. They, they, they don't let God actually finish working on their heart. Yeah. Transforming them into... They, they came into the kingdom realizing, I need to be transformed. Right. But once the transforming process started, it was like, no way. Don't want that. No. 
It's like, just, like, that's what we want. Like, I want to lose weight by give me the pill and I don't want to do anything, all right? All right, give me the shot and I want to look like Owa tomorrow morning, all right? Like, that's it. We want it easy and we want it now. So, like, we're like, God, transform my heart. You know, Eric learned this the hard way this last week. Oh, goodness gracious. You got to be careful what you pray for. Come on, Eric. Eric's Facebook post. God, keep me humble always. Two, Two hours, hours later, later, car accident, airbags off. Oh, total. I said, bro, you better be careful with that prayer. God knows how to keep people humble very well. He's like, I'm humble, bro. I'm humble. Praise God, he's safe, amen. But he ain't got the car right now, amen. But, but God, this is what happens. But you have to wrestle with God. You have to not give up. Right. And you have to allow yourself to get to this point of the one holy passion. Yes. When you realize that I just need to be a true servant of God, I'm covered in the blood of Christ. And there's nothing else in this life that really matters but helping people get to heaven. You know, the truth is, that's what we need the revolutionary house church to become. Yeah. A house church of one holy passion. Woo! That's what we need the A and B house church, the above and beyond house church to become. It's the year of miracles. We're gonna go, God says we can do even greater things above and beyond. Amen? Yeah. That's Eric came up with that cool one. Yeah. That's what we need the guardian house church to come up with. Yeah. Yeah. That's house church, amen? So now you all know your name, so we can start saying that. But that's what we need Portland to become. Yes. A group of disciples where all of us are all in on the one holy passion. Okay. There's no question about our convictions. There's no question about our commitment. There's no question about who's really the Lord of our life. Mm -hmm. But we're all in mm. to serve God. You know, and when we become that, watch out. Wow. Yeah. Watch out. You'll start seeing the book of Acts lived out in this city. Ooh. And so really, as we close out, what's the goal for this next week, these next few weeks? Is it to get some baptisms? Yeah, that'd be great. No one's going to be upset at a baptism. There's never a sad face at a baptism. But really the goal that I want to put before you is get intense about your purpose. Get serious about your purpose. If we can go out and we get intense about our purpose, we won't only have a few baptisms. We'll start to see monthly baptisms in every single house church. Monthly restorations in every single house church. Let us embrace a lifestyle of intensity, but let us stay jubilant, not just in January. Don't be like, oh, January's over, no more joy. No, no. Let us stay jubilant all year long. Let us go after as a house church to be determined, focused, and fearless, living the one holy passion as we work with God and have forceful advancement this next month. And to God be all the glory.